welcome to to this um, um, talk. This is just a one hour talk, and uh, I think the, the, everything will be uploaded online. Okay, so that's a tiny problem for me. So it means that some of the things I can say won't be said because I don't want to talk about some sensitive, but I will talk about many, many interesting things. Anyway, uh, it's just about some state sponsored, uh, backdoors and things like that. Maybe I will tell, uh, less things, but anyway. Okay. Let's start. So welcome and, uh, th thank you for coming. So we're going to talk about something called, uh, nomadic honeypot, uh, and how to use the honeypot concept to create cyber threat Intel and to play with attackers and to create valuable information. So let's cook and play with honey. So that's going to be very simple. Um, the first part is to talk about why honeypots are still valuable, because this is funny. Many people say that honeypots are not valuable, but in this, this is very interesting when you are uh, a white hat, as you can see, I'm a white hat. Uh, so. <coughs> And then we'll talk about the concept of nomadic honeypots, you know, moving the targets. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the results we had, the things we caught online over the internet and few explanation if you want to play at home and create something, uh, that is uh, funny also on your side. So first part, why I believe that honeypots are valuable. Uh, so. What is a honeypot? As you know, it's um, uh, a fake device or application that allows you to delude the attackers and to play with them so that they will lose time, you will get, you will get information against them, and many things like this. So it's interesting. So we will see in this talk how to set up a worldwide honeypot network, and I will try to share our experience um, from, from a research point of view. And how to create cyber threat intelligence through that and how to play with the result we had because it's a little bit complex sometimes when you have many entries uh, in your databases and so on. Uh, I forgot to mention, so I am Laurent Udo. I am the co-founder of Tetris, uh, tetris.com. Uh, you can see we, we are here. You have a booth over there. You can join us. And um, I've been involved in cybersecurity for more than 20 to 30 years, depending if you count when, when I was a kid. And uh, I was a uh, an ethical hacker. Um, I found many security issues on many devices and applications, such as, for example, I broke the BlackBerry. I think I was the fourth guy uh, breaking the BlackBerry. I broke the iPad, the iPhone, uh, many known applications online. And, uh, and this is it. So, and now as a CTO, um, of Tetris, I'm coming with some research results, uh, not a product, even if we have an XDR extended detection response, this is not about the product, this is about research. So honeypot, thanks to a honeypot, you can identify hacking operations and have, you know, um, a vision about what's going on on your infrastructure before the whole attack is happening. So that's very interesting when you have a look at the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, because you can sometimes have some kind of prediction or anticipation. Um, example, let's suppose you have a fake SSH server um, on the internet. Okay, you will have noise, many login and password attempt and so on. So some people say that it's not valuable because it's really noisy. But what if you take all these uh, login and password, and you test them on your intra intranet, let's say you're on your lo local network. <laughs> so this is very valuable because sometimes you can have a match, for example, uh, one login and password that was known outside of your company and that could work inside your company. But maybe these guys will have to break few barriers be before coming here. So you can have prediction and anticipation. That's just a tiny example, of course. And dealing with the mean time to detection and mean time to respond, it can help a lot also because you can have a kind of early warning concept. And if you have an integrated soar in your company, you can try to move to automatic answers also. So <clears throat> few things about honeypot. This is not just about techniques. I know we are not all the same. 
some of you maybe are hackers, some are SISO, some are, are not working on tech issues and so on. So I will try to have uh, many different explanations. So sorry if you are a geek. Sometimes it will not be for geeks. Sorry if you are uh, if you are uh, a SISO. Sometimes it, I will talk about uh, tech stuff and so on. So I will try to share uh, multiple different stuff so that you can have a cool hour with me. So first, let's talk about strategy. If you want to deploy a honeypot, there's a, strategy is really important before the project itself. You have the choice between playing with a low interaction honeypot or a high interaction honeypot. The goal at the end is to create a decoy to delude the, the attackers, as I mentioned. So what is a low interaction honeypot? This is pretty easy. This is just something that will simulate the answer to the request received, for example. So it's limited, okay? It's something like, let's suppose I'm, I'm a fake uh, telnet server, okay? You will send me uh, TCP packets so that you have a discussion with me on port 23, and which is a default one, and then I will send you, for example, through a push hack, uh, my uh, banner, if I have one, and maybe I will invite you to type uh, a login and then a password without the reset, thanks to the uh, presentation session uh, through, the, through the TCP and Telnet layer, and okay, and you will talk with me and so on, but I can say, this is not a good password, this is not a good password, and so on. I'm a fake Telnet server. Maybe you can check it through some of the layers, uh, usually at the application layer, but sometimes with the presentation layer. And, and this is it. This is really limited, but you have interesting statistics and this is not dangerous and this is very easy to deploy. But what is a high interaction honeypot? A high interaction honeypot is when you sacrifice a computer. Let's say, for example, that this is a computer. We put it over the internet and we say, let's hack it guys. It's open. Let's play with it. That's just a, a, a device that is on the internet and we claim that it's a honeypot. Why? Because it's not something we use for real. It's a fake device. So if someone get in, we know it's an attack. So this is pretty cool because sometimes you have an activity in your company and you are not sure if, if, if it's uh, offensive or not with a honeypot. This is very easy. But the problem with a high interaction honeypot is that it's dangerous because you share interaction and the guys maybe will have access to many layers and maybe they could bounce somewhere else and so on. So you have a first, you need to decide what do you want to play with. If you, if, if for example, for a one on one session, you should begin with a low interaction honeypot. Okay. Just a funny concept. Just as a joke, I just asked this morning to chat GPT not to write all the slides, hopefully, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, but I asked myself the question, but, and I said, hey guys, uh, I need a Python code to simulate a fake pop free service with a honeypot. <laughs> this is pretty cool when you're in a hurry and you need to finish your slides. And, and this is it. Uh, that's the last slide with chat GPT. <laughs> don't be, don't be afraid. And this is it. You have a Python, Python code that will just open the 110 that is a default pop free uh, TCP uh, service with a fake banner and you receive the packets and then you said that's just a simulation. Uh, if I receive something with user something, then I will say, okay, which means that, for example, if I say user uh, HITB, uh, it will say, okay. If I say user Laurent, uh, it will say, okay, so that's strange. Of course, the hacker will say that's not the real behavior. Of course, it's not the real behavior because that's a low interaction. That's not a good, that's not a real one. If I say, uh, if I send the password, it will say, yeah, it's okay. And so on and so on. So that's, that's just a stupid tiny example of how to write, uh, a, a low interaction honeypot, uh, directly. Of course, please kids don't, don't use it at home. <laughs> um, so, okay. Second question, which is also very important for strategy. You can work for a spying company. You can work for, for, uh, 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 an official company. You can work for a government agency. You can work for whatever. This is very important to have strategy before playing with technique stuff. And the first question is, do you want to have an exposed honeypot or do you want a kind of internal honeypot? And 
maybe you want to put the honeypot not exactly on the internal network, not exactly outside the, the, uh, company, but maybe in a kind of DMZ, you know, uh, uh, network. So if you put a honeypot over the internet, the problem is that you will have noise, 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 and noise, and sometimes noise also. And the problem is that you will have only attacks, attacks, attacks. You, you have many attacks even in one minute. It's crazy. Internet is really crazy. So some people say that it's not valuable, but thanks to this, you can create, for example, statistics. You can predict what are the trends of the attackers and things like this. So this might be interesting. And also I gave an example with real login and password from the internal network. If you put a honeypot inside your company on the internal network, you will have almost no log. Why? Because nobody should talk to your honeypot because that's a fake device. It's not working for real. Usually you have some kind of uh, interns uh, and people, uh, people that will try to, you know, scan the internal network and sometimes some specific devices like printers and so on that are looking at everything on your uh, intranet and things like this. So, but what if someone get an access and really attack the honeypot for real? Here, th this is highly valuable because maybe it's someone doing, you know, a lateral movement and maybe you found uh, a spy playing inside your company. So that's pretty interesting. And what if we use something that is not exactly on, on, a, on a closed network and not exactly over the internet, but let's suppose that it would be on, on a DMZ and you cannot talk to him, uh, to the honeypot, to it directly, but you could, for example, hack a web server and then bounce to the honeypot. It's true that when someone gets an access to a DMZ, usually they will try to find, you know, what, what are the neighbors and what are the, the devices that could be hacked uh, in the same network area. So that's very important because if you have a honeypot here, not talking to the internet, not receiving information from the internet, you can have also interesting information about the DMZ what was hacked. So that's valuable also. And this is still a strategy. If we look at, for example, um, this, you know, list from the kill chain, uh, and yeah, I think there is just a problem of, uh, with the slide, but anyway, you can see that with low interaction honeypot, we mainly focus on re recon phase and e initial access. And with high interaction honeypot, we are more beyond. Okay. But it's more work also and more dangerous and so on. Okay. So <clears throat> let's talk about the value of honeypot. Let's try to measure the value and let's talk about how to increase the value from a, from a scientist point of view. And this is it. So we began very humble with a kind of 14 countries covered with many honeypots in Europe. Uh, it was made by the Tetris cyber intelligence unit. And we gather many information. It was very interesting, but at the end we had an issue. The issue is that we discovered something you all know. It's the fact that maybe recently you read the things linked to the Vulcan files, as you know, with the Russian guys and so on. And it seems that some of the bad guys, they are lazy or they are smart, let's say, and they don't want to scan uh, the resources twice, twice in a day, twice in a week. Sometimes they want to have a kind of cache like a database and they will refresh the database just once a week or, or things like this. So this is a way for them to know where they can hack if they need to bounce from, from a country to another and so on. Uh, they, they need this kind of database. And it means that when you put a honeypot over the internet, usually you will have the first discovery phase and maybe someone will gain an access. Once you have one guy hidden in your honeypot, you're really happy. At least I am happy. And because you have a friend, so that's cool to have a friend. And even if he, he's really far. And then you can monitor everything, capture the weapons and do funny things. I will give example at the end. But after that, sometimes the mission is finished for them. 
they believe that it's not a valuable target anymore and they have a lack of interest and they will decrease the firepower when they will try to come again, which means that sometimes they already know um, the, the target. We know it thanks, for example, we used our CM, the Tetris CM, and we were able, for example, to see that they were using the same username and we changed many usernames so that we could identify some groups. And we also had the first commands that were launched thanks to Tetris EDR, our endpoint detection and response solution, uh, for example, on Windows, on Linux. And we have the first list of strike that were done inside the Linux or Windows so that we could have some kind of TTP against them and so on. So it was really interesting. And the problem is that when you look on the long term for one group of attackers, the value of the honeypot is decreasing because the time where the guys will play is really shorter and shorter. So it was a problem for us because we wanted to gather as many weapons as we could, as many TTPs as we could and so on. So we said, we should improve this uh, equation. Of course, this is for one group. Sometimes you have multiple curves like this for multiple groups uh, <clears throat> because you have some professionals that are really hacking internet every day. So that's fun. So we said, um, let's introduce a new concept. Let's try to do a kind of nomadic honeypot, which means that you have the discovery and then the guys are coming in your honeypot. You have a friend, you're happy, smile. <laughs> and then you will recycle the target because it's okay. You gather the weapons, the TTP, you know, the behaviors and things like this, and it's okay. And now you delete it, you recycle it, and you change the IP address. And you move somewhere else, moving to another house. You know, it's like with Terminator movie, you know, like uh, Sarah O'Connor. <laughs> and so you are Sarah O'Connor with your honeypot, and the Terminator are hunting you over the internet. And you are doing it like this, like this, like this. And this is very interesting because this is a concept that is called, you know, the automated moving target. And this is a concept that does exist, for example, for the army. When you are uh, uh, on the field, you need to move, uh, especially, for example, if you have snipers. If you are not moving, you can have issues. So this is a cool concept about automating uh, the target. Of course, you will keep the raw logs. You delete the, the, the honeypot, but you keep the raw logs. It's just that the target is destroyed, move elsewhere, over the internet. Let's move to another country. Yes. But what if we don't have only one honeypot, but multiple honeypot with this concept? So we made it. And in more than 50 countries, we deployed more than 1,300 honeypot just for fun, you know, fun and profit, uh, to gather the information. And it was very cool because at the end, we had a strong pipeline of Intel, cyber Intel, and we generated almost automatically cyber threat Intel thanks to that concept. So we said, this sounds great because now we have something that is really valuable and that, that is really funny. So the main issue is you need to move a lot over the internet to change the place of your house, uh, almost few, few, um, few times a day or a few times a week, depending on the situation. So of course you cannot do it uh, on your own infrastructure. So we did, we did it in the cloud, you know, <laughs> that's so cool, the cloud. And <laughs> that's it. So we began with that. And at the end, we had more than 1000 honeypot, mainly in North America, but also in North, North Asia, South Asia, Europe. Yeah, don't be afraid, we kept them. And South America. So 50 countries and we had a kind at the end of weather prediction. It's like the weather. We could say, oh, it's raining in, in Portugal. Oh, it's raining in France uh, because we could see an increase of campaigns. And it was really funny to have this kind of situation. So <clears throat> we were a little bit happy with so many friends hunting us. But of course, I think that for them, it was a problem because it decreased the value of their databases. So I, I, so this is why I said 
that's the problem with the video. I have some things to say, but it will be over the internet. So guys from the related countries, I know we know, I know we know. Okay. So something interesting is that Gartner just uh, created a document about automated moving target defense applied to Honeypot. So there's a guy at Gartner, Lawrence Pingree, and I really like him. He's, he's really awesome. You know him? And he created that document where they said that in the future, according to many Gartner's analysts, they believe that that will be a concept, something with the fact that you will move automatically uh, some targets to change your defensive posture. So we were really happy to say, to discover that what we created for research was a, a new concept that Gartner believes will come in the future so that you can play, for example, with apps, data, runtime, protocol, infrastructure, operating system, and even hardware. They believe that there will be something related to hardware also. So <clears throat> it's the idea behind that is that you will move from a passive situation to a proactive situation. So you need to understand what you can change with more stuff, move, and uh, how, and what is the frequency, and so on. For the honeypot case I shared, it's very easy. You can say, once I'm pretty sure that I am hacked, I will move, because now that's okay. I just want to gather one campaign of hacking attempt, and this is it. But it, what is pretty cool is that when you do that, even if you could do that, for example, on a large-scale infrastructure, it's like adding a layer, like a fog of war, you know, in the games. So that's a kind of game changing, um, proposal for the future. So we, so it seems that the slides had a problem. Is that a PDF or the PowerPoint? Okay. Anyway, uh, so that's, it was a, a kind of seven step operations about, uh, distributed denial of service because our company is, uh, deployed in France, in Spain, in Germany, in the Nordics. But also, we are in Japan and in Canada, Vancouver, and some people asked for help with, you know, DDoS, and we had to think about new way to play with people doing DDoS. So we said, some of them had some kind of, you know, edge firewall in the cloud, and we wanted to put some interesting honeypot over the internet at some places that were targeted so that because we discovered that each time you had a DDoS, sometimes, not each time, sometimes you had a kind of interesting discovery where you could see some behavior patterns and sometimes some IP addresses that were mainly IoT devices that were broken, but also other stuff. And we decided to have from the logs here to send them to our XDR and to have the saw that would say to the external firewall, let's get, let's put this IP address in a forbidden list. And it helps. So that's just a new concept or not so new, but that's, that's a way to show that this is very valuable to play also that way, even for a DDoS operation. But of course, if you are, um, a government agency or if you are a telco company, you should play with that because I'm pretty sure you will have uh, real value. So, okay. So that's a PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. According to Gartner, we should have, let's, they think, 25% of cloud application that will use this kind of uh, autom AMTD concept. Maybe also more deployments till also moving to some hardware possibilities in the future. I don't know. But anyway, what I know is that with the Jedi's and geeks from Tetris, we play a lot and we try to see if there is something valuable as a research project. So we talked about the honeypot, a lot of strategy, but this is important. The, the dynamic honeypot concept. And let's try to have a discussion about some of the things we obtained. Of course, I cannot share everything. And for some parts, I will have to um, keep some secret, I think. Okay, so we created a cycle, life cycle of uh, cyber intel um, because cyber intelligence, when you have a fleet, worldwide fleet of honeypots, is very interesting. 
You plan what you want to gather. You collect the information, which means that sometimes you have to do some specific defensive honeypot strategies to gather the exact things you want to gather. For example, if you are looking at IoT devices, of course, you want to simulate IoT stuff uh, and so on and so on. And then you have the exploitation of the guys and you have some kind of sometimes human analysis. Sometimes you can automize that and then you can share the information to the community or to your customers, to your partners, and so on, based on the low signal that we're able to gather. Okay, just small, easy example. Just for this month, uh, you will say, okay, that's, that's thunder, we know that. Yeah, of course, I know that, of course, me too, but it's just to share and give a first example. Uh, you can do statistics. And if you can have a look at what is inside the, the package, you can say, okay, for example, this is the kind of attacks we had, of course, many SSH stuff, of course, many uh, VOIP stuff, uh, and, and so on and so on. But sometimes this is interesting to see that old attacks are coming back or new CVE uh, are, are exploited in the wild for real and so on. And here is, for example, just for March, the top countries of IP addresses that conducted malicious activities again, uh, against our fleet. So yes, of course, US was the main source of activity. So sorry if you are from Russia, you are not at the top. Sorry if you are not, uh, uh, from, if you are from China, you are not at the top. It was the American. But of course, it, this is because the United States are the biggest uh, infrastructure in the world. This is just that. This is not the country. This is the IP uh, geographic stuff. Netherlands, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you guys. <laughs> I don't know why, but I love that country. <laughs> but you know what? In the nineties, when, when I was in, in the community, let's say, uh, not from Amsterdam, but I mean, the community, uh, I'm talking about hacking stuff. Uh, it's, it's true that you had many hackers doing hacking a tank from Netherlands or Germany. Uh, because sometimes it's, for example, now if you are hacking with a bounce through Germany, this is pretty cool because they have that trap privacy respect, which means that the logs will disappear. So for spies, this is very interesting. And then also many other sources. So this one is not so funny, but this is just the kind of information like what were the top requests on the web honeypot and you can see that we have, for example, the famous uh, Mayurai botnet attempt. You know, it's always the same. That's very interesting because usually they have multiple ways to compile the binaries depending on the fact that they are targeting specific strong arm, arm Intel uh, devices and so on. So these guys are working a lot to break uh, IoT stuff. This is always interesting and so on. Um, like a kind of a top four of the things we saw as trends this quarterly, um, this exploit. So it was funny because it's a real old one. I think this is the PHP five dot. I don't remember something, uh, attempt. So, you know, with the query string hacking attempt, uh, kind of a buffer issue. And uh, this is funny because we saw a, a huge campaign targeting this worldwide, which means that some people maybe improved the old exploit or played with that old exploit. A lot of DDoS attack, especially, unfortunately, in Denmark, uh, as you know. And the US, they were, of course, the main sources, but also the main target uh, over the internet. Really, they were really, really targeted. So it's... Uh, Incredible how the American the, um, clouds are targeted. And also many attempts to enroll devices in, uh, in, uh, in some kind of botnet. Okay, so this one. This one is a little bit complex. So for this one, I will have to just share a few things, but not everything. So it's li linked to Iran. Okay, in Middle East. Uh, so we discovered many interesting things coming out of this country uh, because we moved so many times with our honeypot. When you have more than 1,000 devices 
uh, on Earth and that you are moving all the devices. Let's imagine that you, you change the, the address of the fleet uh, 1,000 times. It means that you will probably use 1 million IP address, but uh, in, in few days. And after that, if you are moving, 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 it's a little bit crazy. So, and something funny is that once we got the IP address of, of, of something, and this something was a command and control for backdoors hidden in Iran and hidden on some devices like iPhone, Android, and so on. So we don't know if it's Iran looking at Iran citizen. We don't know if it's not linked to Iran, uh, but we have an idea. Uh, we don't know who is playing remotely and so on, but this is funny. So this is why this one, and we have other slides that were forbidden. Uh, this one is... Um, is a little bit funny. You can see here, for example, the the request, but you have some kind of easy stuff like some kind of versions here, um, and you had some kind of uh, date, like you know, to say that you are still here, and you had some, you know, that it's UTC three and a half an hour for um, Tehran and uh, Iran. So it's um, it's a little bit different sometimes when you try to find if the peop if it was with a human activity or not. And what is quite funny is that it's not written here, but we had also the you know HTTP 1.1 host uh, field, which is used for HTTP 1.0 also, but it's written in the norm if you are, love the norms uh, in the HTTP 1.1 uh, norm and. The, the, the host names, uh, were, were not, were fake ones. Which means that, for example, we had domains with fake domains. So now we, we have the list of the domain and we can monitor if someone is registering the, the domain. We asked ourselves, should we, should we buy the domains? Uh, but we decided to avoid that because we believe that it's a kind of spying operation. And for the SIMCOM, for the guys knowing that, it's of course linked to something when you try to access the internet with some SIM card uh, and so on, especially there and so on. So this is funny because we got an access on something we we never asked. And it was really complex because we had so many data that we were able just to do that thanks to the fact that inside the XDR, we had some tools uh, inside the Tetris XDR to have an access to things that are different. Because if you play with that, this kind of concept with Honeypot, your main issue will be if you have too many data to check, you will have to create some kind of algorithm so that you can see that there is something new. Because this is very important to just focus on what is new, okay? Okay, <clears throat> so this one was something interesting. It was this year linked to uh, PHP, um, and you have the list of targets in Europe. So uh, the biggest one was in Portugal, then Pol Poland, then Czech uh, Republic, then Spain, and so on. And we saw a huge increase uh, of uh, attacks just here, so 21st, 20, 23rd uh, March, uh, a huge increase of uh, PHP attack. I think it was something known as an attack. It was a PHP my admin uh, attacks, but with specific uh, uh, loads. And it was very interesting because sometimes you see an activity somewhere and we found the activity. Indeed, 50% of the sources were in China. 22% were in other countries in Asia. But what is interesting is that on some famous discussions, underground forums from China with Chinese hackers, we saw that they had a discussion about this PHP flow. So it was very funny to see that what we could see as the weather of the internet, you know, uh, was also linked to real discussion for, from hackers. So this is interesting. Here, this one, um, yes, was a famous one. It was with, uh, you know, the vulnerability that was used by some hackers that tried to do, to use uh, VMware uh, ESXi to create a ransomware where they could cipher your data by just letting .args uh, as a file on your cloud. So it was a, a really scary one. We saw kind of attempts 
in mid January, like a, hop, a, a, a scan of the, I think it's 427 uh, TCP port. And, and then a, a real attack two weeks after that. And then a huge campaign. And this is very interesting because this is exactly what I mentioned at the beginning. <coughs> you can be, you can know that someone created something strange and that a new campaign is coming. So it's, uh, it's always very interesting. And, uh, the origin of the request were mo mainly from North America. This is just IP address. Of course, when I say from this country and so on, this is, it, it does not mean that this is uh, the uh, NSA stuff and so on. Maybe it's French hacker. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Something else linked to the, uh, uh United States. It's, um, the, the midterms elections, uh, process. So Tetris is part of the Cyber Threat Alliance and, uh, Cyber Threat Alliance is very in incredible. It's a kind of club with people. Um, maybe we are commercial opponents, but we prefer to share, uh, Cyber Threat because we all believe about the fact that if we work together as a team against the attackers, that's a way to decrease the power of the attackers. So we believe in attrition. It means that, for example, when we find a new weapon, we prefer, if it's a specific weapon, to share it to uh, the commercial opponent because we know that they will use them to create their own signatures and destroy all the C2 uh, servers online so that uh, for the attackers, the cost to get an access to a customer, uh, it will be too big when they uh, find, for example, your stuff. So this is very interesting. So we, we had a, a tiny discussion. They shared 63 malicious IP addresses that were used to target the midterm election infrastructures. And usually when we share IP addresses, we are almost, we almost have 100% that matches, uh, because what they had, for example, with, uh, with Siza, uh, as evil IP addresses of the week or something like this. This is the same that what we have also and so on. But for that particular operation, we had only 13 uh, IP addresses that were linked to um, this, which probably means, okay, probably I said, that it was um targeted attack against the American uh, Poles infrastructures. So it was very interesting also um, as an operation. And this one <coughs> was something found uh, by uh, the the CERT and threat research team from Tetris, where they discovered in mid-January that there were a kind of new weaponization of um, something linked to um, mining, uh, crypto miner um, guys, where they had very interesting way to target the Linux servers over the internet where they would wait for one week to two weeks once they had, for example, an access uh, because they wanted to, they had a team to open the devices, but it was not really a team, it was more a robot. And then some people that would look at some things, and it's very interesting because you have all the commands, thanks to uh, the Tetris CDR. And then after that, you could see that, for example, uh, what was the goal? And the goal was, they had a kind of, <coughs> In the code, you had some kind of uh, possibility like if the box that is compromised has enough capacity, then it would deploy the miner. Okay. It was named Dicot. I don't know if you're Romani, but if you are, you know that this is the official agency uh, targeting financial stuff and uh, hacking stuff. So I don't know if it's a game from the hackers to play with this agency. And they had a fast and steady function for this deployment. And if the box was too small, no matter, the robot would just try to bounce elsewhere to the internet and try to have the target. But how? Simple. They use Discord, Discord infrastructure. So that was very funny to have outbound traffic with Discord discussions that were recorded and from bot to bot. And this, it was very funny because it shows you that sometimes when you are in a large scale infrastructure, you will not blacklist 
Discord because, you know, it's not that you are lazy, but maybe you will have one guy claiming, I cannot go to a Discord and so on. So it's, it's a mess. And this is why now you see the hackers using, you know, some common infrastructures, uh, so that they can be sure that the discussions, hidden discussions, uh, will, will, will be a, available, uh, for them. And also we saw that Nextron, which is a very nice, uh, excellent uh, German company, uh, created also some kind of analysis with an over timeline, which shows that this is very interesting to share uh, and to have a look at statistics for this kind of uh, operations. Okay, so now let's try to have a tiny discussion about um, how to do it on your side. Of course, not everything, but just some concept. So as I said, and if, if you are, if you're lost, you can ask chat GPT or not, or one equals one. If you speak SQL. So <clears throat> choose your defensive weapon. So the first question is you want to create your honeypot because you, you say, Oh yes, I want to play. I want to play. Okay. So what do you need? Just go, for example, on, on, on the net and you will have many open source uh, solutions and on this awesome list, uh, I found many, many interesting open source, uh, solutions. So you can say, for example, that you want to create a fake tenel server, you know, so that the people will, will be able to log in. Uh, you can create a fake SSH server. This is the same a little bit, uh, with more features, but it's ciphered. Uh, you can say, okay, I want to create a fake web server because I want to have a look at web attacks. Uh, or Windows, emails, databases, and so on. Oh, emails. Is that possible to create uh, a fake email honeypot server? So that's interesting, yes. The main issue is that let's imagine that there is a real email crossing your honeypot infrastructure. It would mean that you recorded an email. From a legal point of view, it's not exactly the kind of things we do, uh, at least in Europe. So maybe you have to think about legal issues. Okay. So things like the first one is outbound traffic. I said that this is my honeypot. It's a nice one. No. Okay. And, uh, so this is a honeypot. Let's suppose that I have some guys, uh, hacking this box. Cool. I have the weapons. I can look at the activity, what they are doing. That's interesting. Oh, I didn't know this weapon. Let's keep it for the next time and so on. And the problem is, what if the bad guys use that box to bounce to whitehouse.gov? Something like this. The problem is that if you rented this server over the internet, it means that you are the guy that is trying to hack uh, a government agency, which is a problem, of course, because you are the attacker. So there is a legal issue, probably. So you don't want to have this kind of issue. So we will see that you have to balance the philosophy of playing with hackers and the real life after that. Or maybe you you don't mind about legal issues, but <laughs> that's another problem. Also, in some countries, you have some laws like uh, linked to entrapment, meaning that, for example, you don't have the right to uh, give drug or sell drugs if you are a cop, uh, because they would say that you try to create a trap uh, and, uh, and, and that's, that's not cool. So sometimes in some countries you have discussions about this. You, usually it's not a big deal. It's not a big problem. SLA, that's funny from a commercial point of view. Let's suppose you want to create an honeypot for, uh, customers. We have many customers using our deceptive response on earth. And some of the questions sometimes is what about the SLA? What do you mean by the SLA? But I mean, what if the honeypot, for example, reboot for five minutes? Uh, I say, okay, who are your customers? The hackers. And they cannot have an access to the honeypot. Okay, so that's not a big deal. I mean, they will not come and say, hey, I cannot hack you anymore. Uh, what about the SLA? <laughs> you had to reboot the honeypot. So SLA and things like this, it's cool. This is less production, at least when you are talking about research. Please don't laugh. <laughs> I will. Okay, let's talk about GDPR, Global Data Privacy Regulation. So this one is really great also. That's a real question. Do we have the right to record the commands uh, from the hackers and to record the IP addresses and so on? So 
it's true that, for example, in our situation, I'm still waiting that some spies come to our company and say, we know that you have our IP address and our tools, and we ask you to respect the GDPR because you, we want you to get our IP address out of your database and so on. No, it does not exist. But it's true that there is a kind of trouble zone. So I wanted to mention it here. And another risk is linked to the manpower. The problem is that why would you play with Honeypot while your Active Directory is not secure? First, you will play with your Active Directory and try to harden it for real and, and everything else also. So this is why sometimes Honeypot are not the first solution that is uh, deployed because this is, of course, not mandatory. Of course. But suppose that you have time. Suppose that you have an internship and so on. And you could try to play and try to understand if there is something cool uh, to analyze. Dealing with the protocols and application you will choose. Also, if you choose something like, for example, Telnet, what is pretty cool is that it's not used anymore compared to 20 or 30 years old. Uh, hacking strategy that you had in the past, but it's interesting because it's clear text, which means that, for example, if you uh, use, for example, a capture of the traffic, uh, this is interesting because you will be able to have some interesting pickup that you can share to blue uh, uh, or sometimes red team or purple team that want to have many interesting pickup of some uh, with interesting strategies and so on, so that you can create network intrusion, detection system, signatures, and so on. So it's always interesting sometimes if you are not sure about what you had inside the honeypot itself uh, to collect information, to have also something to collect some um, data from uh, off the network. So you are not alone, you know, like the song from Michael Jackson. And you are not alone, and you can play also as a team. For example, uh, even in Europe, in Europe, we have many strong guys doing Honeypot stuff. If you look at the Honeypot open source community, you have many, many guys in Europe. And here, this is a, a document from the ENISA itself. W even if it's old, more than 10 years old, the Polska team from with the cert created something really awesome. M really, you can still read it, learn a lot about high interaction, low interaction, uh, interesting open source stuff, even if some of them disappeared or changed and so on, that it gives you a background. So it shows you that this is not something new. This is something that is really, really interesting. You can join other experts and you also have this project that was working a lot in the past, at least 20 years uh, uh, before now. And um, it's called the HoneyNet project. Uh, and it was so the first mantra of the HoneyNet project was know your enemy. Uh, it was Lenz Pisner that created this concept. And it was very interesting because it was a way to try to have a kind of community that wanted to share information and tools uh, to play with the attackers. So you can easily find friends uh, also uh, in the real life to play with attackers. And now let's talk about some technical advice uh, about how to implement uh, the honeypot. So. Strategy, first, you need to decide what you want to do. Low interaction, high interaction, exposed or not. Uh, let's, let's play. Who would like to create, uh, if you have only one choice, low or high, what do you prefer? Low, raise your hand. Okay, and high interaction. <laughs> so, okay, so, <laughs> so it's more high interaction. So, high interaction is complex. Yeah, you will lose time, but you will have more interesting data about the attacker. And then you have to choose if you want to have an exposed over the internet or a hidden only point uh, inside your uh, network so that you can catch spies playing with, you know, uh, or criminals playing with, um, you know, uh, lateral movement and so on. Then you just need to set up your fake environment. So if it's a high interaction, you can just take a box, put it and say, now I just have to wait for a hack. Yes, but maybe you will wait for years, especially if you use, for example, you take, I don't know, a Ubuntu 
you put it over the internet and you wait for hackers. By default, you don't have accounts that can be hacked directly. So maybe after that, after setting up the fake environment, you will also have to decide what you want to open so that the attackers can come in. Or you can say, I want to wait for zero days. It's true, mainly for Windows. Windows is a great idea. You put some um, natural, normal Windows over the internet and you wait to be hacked. And once you hacked, uh, especially if you had the upgrades, then you will probably have, uh, you know, uh, a zero day that came through uh, the wires uh, to your honeypot. The problem now is to get access to the zero day itself. And sometimes it's really complex because that could be specific uh, packets that are hidden in some kind of cipher traffic, and then it's complex. Uh, that could be also something that is hidden in memory. Uh, let's think about what happened, for example, with the NodePetya operations. Uh, you had to have a look at the memory. So it means that you need to be able to dump the memory off and to do a strong analysis, which is not so easy sometimes, and so on and so on. So you have to choose what you want to do. If you want to do something very easy, you just go to the internet, you choose a list of common users that are targeted and the common passwords. You will not choose the one, two, three, four, five, six, for example, because you, you want the hackers to believe that you, it was a, a complex uh, hacking uh, operations. So we'll, you will choose something that is really valuable, like, uh, I don't know, uh, not admin 123, but something that is more, uh, that is less known, but that is really, uh, that is in the common DAG channeries. And you have some live information like this over the internet. And then you wait. But of course, you also need to collect and export the data, of course. So you can use anything you want. Uh, for us, for example, we use our own technology like our EDR. Uh, our DNS firewall, our CM, our network traffic analysis, uh, our SOAR to send some stuff, uh, our database with our XDR, uh, and so on and so on. But it's up to you. I mean, you can just choose whatever you want so that you can collect and export the data. So sometimes you have to manage personalities. Personalities like, for example, la here you, you see me like, uh, I don't know how you see me, <laughs> but maybe some serious CTO guy, but if I'm doing like this, I change my personality, I'm another guy. Cool. So sometimes you will have to do the same kind of trick with your honeypot. You will have to change the personality of the honeypot because you don't want the hackers to know that it's the same group of defensive white hat guys uh, that are playing with them. So, and then you can try to create valuable CTI. As I, I explained, you can have network traffic, system logs, applicative logs, uh, system syscalls that you code, for example, the sys underscore execv on Linux because you want to have all the executions. So if you want, you can create your own module, kernel module, hook yourself and have an access to everything. And if you want, you can hide your module so that the guys, when they will do something like LS mode, they won't be able to see that you change some stuff and so on and so on. It depends how deep you want to go. There is no good way. As you know, this is just, yes, this is the way. I say the Mandalorian. So, and you have also active, uh, some kind of options. Some are funny. Some are maybe illegal. But let's talk about everything. You can try to have some active defense spirit, which means that, for example, someone pushed you and you decide to reply. You could, for example, pay with a kind of counterattack spirit. Of course, it's illegal. But anyway, as you know, for example, the war in Ukraine is the most digitalized war on Earth ever. But this is just the beginning of a new um, area where we will see many, many attacks and maybe also this year with many issues. So of course, when some country be act with a too big uh, issue, I'm pretty sure you will see some kind of countermeasures, but, uh, but you could also do some kind of funny stuff like put some poison gift, you know? So poison gift would be 
uh, like you put a, a, a PDF uh, or dot .doc files uh, with a beacon so that you can have the IP address when someone will open it if they are really dumb hackers and so on. So up to you, but this is optional. So how can you do that? <coughs> so we have the internet, okay? That's that's the board where we want to play, okay? We have the players, cool. So many players on the internet. And you just have to create the toy so that they can play with your toy and hack you. So you will put a high interaction on Hipot because this is what you decided. I was sure it was a high. And you have a gateway just at the entrance. Thanks to that gateway, there is something very important to do. It's all about the outbound traffic, as I mentioned previously, because you don't want to have people using your honeypot to hack something official over the internet with your IP address because this is you, the source of the attack. So that's one of the tricks. Uh, you can use some people that are really paranoid, use proxies. Some are using um, other concept, but even if you use, for example, filtering, you could, for example, just use, uh, I'm a fan of Linux, so with NetFilter part of the kernel, for example, you can use uh, an FT or IP table and say that you want to use the limit module and say that you will limit the number of packets per minute and things like this. So you can create yourself your strategy. This is funny. And something more important, and we will finish on that concept, is the fact that once they are in the honeypot, they don't know it's not the reality. So remember Morpheus from Matrix? Yeah, you know that here you're not in the real world, that's just a Matrix, okay? And uh, so Morpheus said, have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? And what I'm gonna show you is a kind of tiny funny stuff because I don't want to have some issues. So just a tiny example about how to play with the fact that when the guys are here, they are so strong, so smart, because they, th they say, yeah, I broke a box, I am root of the box, and so on, but they don't know it's a fake one. And here is something really stupid and funny. It means that, for example, you can change the rules on the getaway and say, for example, so I put the IP table or NFT, say, for example, once I get something that we move, for example, with the pre-routing rules, from outside of the internet. And if it's my IP address, because I want to connect myself to the honeypot also, okay? So that's a green uh, green IP address. Um, then I will use the source NAT, you know, to change the IP address of my box. And I will change it to that IP address, which is today the biggest attacker uh, from China. And if you do that, then, for example, let's suppose that you are the hacker. You had an access of, on the honeypot. Of course, this is not the login, the username that will be used and not the name, the host name of the device, but it's for you to understand. Let's suppose they launch the command W or who or netstat uh, uh, dash uh, something. And this is it. For example, with W, they will say, okay, I am the hacker. I can see that I am connected. And here, this is an IP address from... Uh, Russia and it's and then they see that there is a Chinese guys and when they look at the track over the internet they say whoa we are with the best Chinese hackers on earth right now you can also put the uh, French government IP address you can put the uh, NSA IP address you can put whatever you want because that's not the real world Neo okay so here is a red pill. No, no pills in Amsterdam. Uh, so <clears throat> this is this is a trick. And what can you do after that? They think that what they see is a reality, but it's not true. Which means that we did it at Tetris, and we launched discussions with them. You know, with the old talk command. So, <laughs> but they didn't want to respond. <laughs> some of them, and sometimes some responded. <laughs> and it was funny because they thought that we were hackers also. And we created discussions and we saw that it's interesting for profiling, for the entrapment, uh, or for, let's say, for the cops, agencies. This is very interesting because you can do some kind of human fingerprints, the language, for example. And even if they try to speak English, 
maybe they are not really English with some details. You can see that they are not natively speaking English uh, and so on. And maybe it will help you at doing attribution. So it means that honeypot are very interesting also for law enforcement uh, and authorities and things like this. And also you can have some exchanges, for example, I saw your backdoor. Ah, oh, it's funny. It was in slash dev slash SHM, uh, and so on because I am root and you are just, you know, uh, a simple user. I took your, your code. It's funny. You know, we have uh, more interesting stuff. Oh, wow. And that's a way to, you know, infiltrate this group, hacking groups and to do some kind of spying stuff. So as it's online, no, we don't spy on, sp on spies, of course. And then you have some proofs about the hackers. You can, gather their logs and other tools, sorry, and have fun, as I said. So this is it. So if you want to play with fake devices uh, and that you don't know how to do and that you, you do not hesitate to contact me, for example, on LinkedIn, but especially what I want to say is that this is a huge project, if it's, even if it's not a commercial project. If you are working for a government agency, uh, a telecom operator, or internet operator, and so on, and that you have many IP addresses, and that you want to play and that you need us to deploy things, contact me. That could be interesting to have fun with the players. And this is it. Thank you. And thank you to Hack in the Box crew. And special thank you to the Tetris squad, especially the Cyber Intel unit, the CERT, the Threat Research, our SOC in Japan, because they helped me on some of the sides, the research and development department, the expertise and services, the business team, yes, and the marketing guys and girls. See you guys. Okay, any any questions? Oh. Uh, it was a very good speech, by the way. Um, I, just making my own assessment on what you've said, you must have quite an extensive knowledge of the current situation, especially in Europe with uh, in terms of cyber attacks. Um, with all the honeypots that you have deployed, um, have you noticed any increase in attacks on uh, SCADA systems, for example? You mean SCADA system? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, good question. So, we <clears throat> we have not just European logs, but we have uh, we are deployed in fifty countries. But we, from what we see, it seems that the bad guys are not trying to find OT devices directly. Some of them are trying to find this kind of devices, but this is not the real uh, hackers. This is mainly people trying to open doors, and then they sometimes uh, ask people to buy this open box, and then some people will then try to check if there is something valuable like SCADA stuff. For now, to be honest, we have not been able to catch uh, a SCADA attacks yet over the internet, but I hope we will. Good I'm question. Sure too. Yeah. But anyway, we have Honeypot, but this is not the same product. This is our commercial product, the deceptive response. And we have some of them deployed in many countries, especially in Europe, but even in China and so on, protecting sensitive plants, uh, things linked to nuclear stuff, things linked to uh, etc. And there, we capture things, but this is not over the internet. This is on uh, internal network. And yes, yes, we capture things. Usually it's just, you know, they just try to target uh, Windows, uh, stuff like MSSQL uh, stuff, link, still linked sometimes to the Stuxnet stuff. You will know with the default password that are known and so on. And they try to rootkit the, the Windows box and so on. But this is not over the internet. This is inside the network. Okay. Do you have yeah, we, we created something called Tetris War Games and uh, we have some partners uh, that want us to open the Tetris war games because in this war game you have uh, the red teams, uh, the blue teams, it's our SOC, and the purple team, the CERT and so on, and that is trying to organize a game. Uh, we plan to do a, a real big one norm normally this year with more people coming from outside. So if you're interested about playing with us, uh, maybe you are one of our partners, but shoot us an email and uh, we will see uh, how to play with you. Thank you for your question.